Chris Soniker with the student council. And we need to donate to Gifts from the Heart because not every family is as fortunate as you are. And there are very a lot of needy families in your community this year that want a Christmas dinner just like you'll have. So just think about others during this Christmas season. Next. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Okay, guys, so this is where we left off. So this is section 12.5, and this is heat engines and thermal pumps. So a heat engine converts heat energy into work. So we've already talked about how a thermal cycle would work. We put in energy. We have to get some work out of that energy. But are we going to be able to transfer 100% of the energy into work? No, because not any machine, there's no machine that we have found that is 100% efficient. So according to the second law of thermodynamics, it cannot convert all of the heat energy supplied into work. So here's how your basic heat engine will work. There's a hot <laughs> reservoir, there's a cold reservoir, and then there's a machine to convert some of that heat energy into work. Um, we also have already talked about what a thermal, what a thermal cycle is. And just for you and just for your notes, let's write down that a thermal cycle is a series of processes. Where's mine? that brings the system to starting conditions. Okay, so again, a thermal cycle is a series of processes that brings the system to starting conditions. So we talked about this in class today, that it's kind of like a circle. If I started here on my circle, and this circle had a certain pressure and a certain volume, it's gonna go all the way around through this cycle and then I'm gonna to have to come back to the beginning. So I'm gonna to have to start again originally with this certain pressure and this certain volume. So that's my thermal cycle. Chris, we go to the next slide. Okay, so this would be more of a visual diagram of how a heat engine would work. We're taking energy or heat from a high temperature reservoir. So I just have a very high amount of temperature that I'm taking energy from. I'm converting some of this energy into work. So I have this huge arrow, this huge amount of energy that I'm taking, and I'm converting some of that, just a little bit of it, into work. So that's where I see this work coming out. I have another arrow, though, that's leaving and that's because I can't possibly convert all of that energy into work. So some of that energy is going to leave into a lower temperature reservoir. Because if I take away some of this higher heat, some of this higher temperature, I'd be left with not as much high movement, molecular molecules colliding. I'd have to be left with a lower temperature. So I'm going to have some heat that has to leave or come out. Again, think about it like a car. We talked about that a car is only 20% efficient, so this car is taking heat, it's making it into work, 20% work, and then the rest of it is leaving, it's exhausted out. So 80% of what we originally had started, started with is leaving, just in the form of exhaust. This right here, this should be no different than what we've already talked about with thermodynamic processes, that the amount in this box here, between my pressure and my volume diagram, is the work. So I can always find work of whatever's in this box. We did that today in your FRQ. We also showed that with all those four processes. So if we wanted to find work, we could do that with our pressure times our change in volume. So I can always find my work that way in that total box area. Along with this, this pressure volume, since this is a PV diagram, Let's look at what each of these bars mean. When a bar is a straight vertical line, that would indicate that my volume is constant. And when volume is constant, do you remember what process that's called? When we have constant volume. What is it, girls? Isometric. Louder. Very good. Louder. Isometric. So if 
If this is isometric, then that means I'm going to call this line an isomet. Now I have my horizontal line. This would indicate that pressure is remaining the same. So if my pressure remains the same, I would call that an isobar. Because when, remember, pressure is constant, then that means that where it's an isobaric process, um, think again, isobaric barometer, barometer measures pressure. So this would be an isobar. So now let's look at this next line. So we went from, we actually started here, from four to one. Now we're going from one to two, that's an isobar. Now I want us to look at from two to three. Well again, if it's a vertical line down, which is indicating constant volume, this one is also going to be an isomet. From three to four, this would be an isobar, because pressure is constant again. So when you are looking at a heat engine and the amount of work on a PV diagram, you're always going to have two isomets and two isobars. And all this means is, at some point in your, at some point in your cycle, pressure had to be constant and volume had to be constant. That's all this means. So it's just kind of setting up this really nice box for you to calculate area with. So there's that. Um, another thing that kind of helps me to think about for this, in terms of how a heat engine would work, you take something from a high heat temperature reservoir, you convert a little into work, and then you have leftover heat that's going to move into a cool energy reservoir. I like to think about this as you are a poor pork kid, you're a poor student, you need money. Huh? Gifts from the heart. <laughs> gifts from the heart, yes. Donate to gifts to the heart. Do it, guys. Or we'll find you. Yeah, or Chris will find you and beat you. With this. Okay. With that. So we take from a high temperature reservoir, we do work, and then some of that energy is then exhausted out. Think about when you need money, you take money from your parents who would have a high money cash flow. They have, some, they have way more money than you do. So since they have more money, you can take some of that money and convert that into shopping. So you can go buy something. You're not going to spend all of it. You may have some left. So then the rest of that money is going to be pocketed into your, your own wallet, your own purse. And that is considered to be a low temperature reservoir because you don't have as much money as your parents do. So it's kind of the same thing. Parents have lots of money, you need money to go shopping. You take some of that money and spend it. Once you've spent some of that money, you still have some left that you're pocketing because you don't have as much as what your parents had started with. So that's just an analogy. Ask me. Is that like the car thing? It's like the car. I take lots of energy. I have lots of energy to get my engine to, to run. I can do some amount of work to make my car start, but can we use all of that 100% energy? No. So that's where this energy is coming out of. So I, I started with 100, I did 20% of work, I'm left with 80% of this extra heat that's coming out. It's exactly like the car. Exactly like the car. Okay, next. Oh. Way too much. <laughs> We have a guest speaker today, Mr. McNall. McNall, we're filming Yay, a video. Go McNall. Okay, so we can actually calculate the efficiency of a heat engine. And how we do that, this little, this little funny shaped E, that stands for epsilon. It's a Greek letter epsilon. I have E, which this stands for the thermal efficiency. The thermal efficiency is going to be equal to the net work out over the amount of heat that's put in. So very simply, we have the work, the net work, over the amount of heat that we put into the system. So thermal efficiency, again, that's my E, is going to be equal to the work that we're doing divided by the amount of heat that we're putting in. If we want to know how much work is in a heat engine. This is how you find it here. 
I find my work, my net work, by taking, this would be, this H is going to be the amount of heat. I can't. I'm videotaping. This is going to be the amount of heat that you put in minus the amount of heat that's given out. Or the amount of heat that's expelled. So QH, you're also going to see that in your book, they use it two different ways. So QH is the same thing as QN. So I'm going to write this here. QH is the same thing as QN. So that just means we have to get our heat from a hot energy reservoir. Q would be, your QH would be a hot energy reservoir. So I'm putting heat into my engine. So that would be from a high temperature reservoir. So QH, QN are the same thing. I know that makes it really confusing in your book, but that's how they do it. So you're just gonna have to know that when they say QH, they also mean the amount of heat that you're putting in. And you're getting that heat from a very high temperature, or high temperature, re high temperature reservoir. QC is the same thing as the heat that's coming out. So let's think of our car. I'm trying to put in 100% heat. I'm giving this 100% of heat. Or let's just say, if it's 100% heat, let's just say we're putting in 100 joules. I have to do some amount of work. So let's say that the work that I'm doing is only 20 joules. Then that means that my car is exhausting 80 joules. So when I think about these two, this would be my QH because this is what energy I'm putting in. So this is the amount of energy that I'm putting into the engine. I'm getting some amount of work. So again, this is my QH or my QN. And then this 80 joules is what I'm getting out. So that would be my QC. It's going to a colder energy reservoir. Or I could call that Q out. Okay, so I hope this helps. If you have questions, email me. But this right here is how we're going to find our net work.